Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a really great pleasure to be here. This is a special place, and we've been very honored to be associated with the Ben Graham Center and and uh, the Ivy Business School. And um, it's really one of the great joys in my life, and we've been able to um, pleased to be able to support the Stacy Muirhead Prize, but I also take a great deal of pleasure, even though it always hits at a bad time of the year for me to uh, uh, read through all the uh, student investment reports uh, as we're as as the schools deciding what to put in, what investments to make in the Ivy Fund, and it's it's just a, a lot of fun for me. So this is a very special place, and you know, I sometimes when you're in a special place you don't realize that you're in a special place and maybe it takes a few years after you leave ivy to appreciate what a wonderful learning environment you have and what a wonderful uh, um, what wonderful work george has done to blend not only the theoretical and the learning piece, but with the practical piece. And, uh, you know, I've seen the, 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 the speakers that you've had here over the years and have had the privilege of, of introducing a few of them over the years and, and knowing many of the speakers that have come through here. And I just think it's absolutely uh, phenomenal what you have here if you are an inspiring value investor and so just encourage you to to soak it all in and uh george just congratulate you on what what you've created here uh, through a lot of hard work and effort and uh so um it's it's just great to be here i thought what i'd like to do is spend some time setting up for you how we invest at stacy muirhead and then take you into a couple of case studies of some investments that that we've made and you know i will spend a little bit of time on on our performance record uh, not because i'm trying to sell you anything but just because i think you need to understand contextually um, what we're about so that's what i hope to accomplish tonight and 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 leave lots of time for uh answering any questions that you may have at the end of this so let me start with just a very quick overview of our firm. Um, after working in the brokerage business for uh, five or six years, um, I started the firm in, in 1994. Um, it's independently owned and operated. Um, you know, I should preface, uh, if you go back on the website a couple of years ago, Richard Lawrence from Overlook Investments spoke uh here at the center and you know one of the things that he talked a lot about was the importance of having the right structure and the right setup to an investment management firm culturally philosophically structure wise and that that um, in and of itself put you in a position to get better results and you know he sort of talked at the time i recall that you know it was one of the hidden lessons of investing that doesn't get talked about enough and of course trying to get the right kind of clients not just any client you know clients that have the same time horizon that you do so we've thought a lot about these things at Stacy Muirhead and uh, I would never say we've gotten it 100 percent correct but we have at least thought about these things and tried to design um, a firm and an investment culture and structure that will enable us to uh, do the best that we can on behalf of our clients. So we're independently owned and operated. I only say that because, you know, we have the luxury of serving clients. We don't also have to ship quarterly dividend payments up to some publicly traded parent company, uh, you know, and, and meet some sort of investment bogey. We can, because we're independently owned and operated, we can have only one uh, one focus and that's serving clients to the best of our ability. Uh, based in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, an hour down the road, as you heard, I got a second-rate inferior education at, uh, at another Ontario university that doesn't in any way match up to the Ivy School. The only thing I can say is that when the Ben Graham Center was looking for a professor to come here and 
run the center, they went to Laurier to recruit uh, uh, Professor George. So uh, we're based in Waterloo, Ontario. Focused um, investment culture, what does that mean? We're not trying to be all things to all people. We think we can do one thing and we're going to try and do or have tried and we'll continue to try to do that to the very best of our ability. And, and married to that is just the notion of having a simple business structure. Um, we run two funds and one separate account. And, you know, we have no intention of, you know, creating um, a plethora of investment funds or running, you know, 500 separate accounts. I think that dilutes your effort. And so the price we pay for that is, you know, we are not the world's largest investment management firm and we have no interest in becoming the world's largest investment management firm. Uh, we, we just want to, to keep things very focused and simple. Um, Long-term investment horizon. Everybody talks about this, um, but I really can't emphasize it enough. You know, we think in decade long periods of time, we try and attract investors to our firm who have a long term investment horizon. And, you know, you'll always be surprised in that regard, uh, both both negatively and positively uh, uh, by clients. But, you know, we really do try and bring a long-term investment horizon to everything we do. And then a, a big part of our firm structure is alignment of our interests with our investors. Um, you know, 100% of my personal capital, uh, the capital uh, of our firm, uh, of my spouse and other members of my family is 100% invested in our funds uh, alongside our investors. Uh, many of our other personnel also have uh, uh, investments in our fund and it, it, we just think that's the right way to behave. And so that's also a very important part of what we do. Uh, five employees at present. So that's a, a quick overview of, of what we're about. I'll spend a little bit more time on uh, investment philosophy and, and talk you through how we invest. So what is the essence of what I'd call the Stacy Muir headway? There's really three elements to it. Global perspective, you know, I think that's pretty self-evident. We're willing to go anywhere um, and look anywhere around the world for investment opportunities. Um, obviously, that's an evolutionary statement and not um, an absolute point in time statement. You know, no one can hang out their shingle and say they can evaluate every security around the world uh, with equal ability. And, you know, that's something that year by year by year uh, we push out further. Um, but certainly we just think that if you're looking globally, that's um, better than confining your search to a single country. Um, have a value mindset. Um, as you'll see in a bit, we, we bring, a um, uh, although there's many similarities to the things that, that uh, Professor Athanasakis has been teaching you, you know, we have some subtle differences, but I think are still solidly within the value uh, investing uh, uh, camp. And, and so we consider ourselves to be value investors. And then I think what makes us... Um, if not unique, certainly in the minority, is that we have a multi-strategy approach to investing. And I'll, I'll break that down in a little bit more detail in a moment. So just a comment, you know, went through it there. Global perspective, if you look worldwide, you'll find more bargains than if you can find your search to any single country. Um, Sir John Templeton, uh, I know you had Lauren Templeton here uh, last year. Um, Sir John Templeton was a big influence in, in, in my life in terms of uh, helping us think that way. Value mindset, uh, just borrowed a quote from Buffett. Obviously, we're huge fans. I've been to this year will be Berkshire Hathaway meeting number 27 in a row for me. Um, so we're big fans, but that quote, the basic ideas of investing are to look at stocks as businesses. 
use market fluctuations to your advantage and seek a margin of safety. That is what Ben Graham taught us. A hundred years from now, they will still be the cornerstones of investing. And I know this is very much in line with what you're learning um, in your investment classes here. This quote, incidentally, was uh, a quote given by Buffett at the 100th birthday of Benjamin Graham, and it coincided with the release of a book by uh, Janet Lowe, who um, wrote a, a biography about Ben Graham's life, and uh, so I think that's kind of interesting. So the one area that's maybe less well known is this notion of a multi-strategy approach, and what do I mean by that? Um, there's really four elements to what we do. And I'll break this down in more detail as we, we go through it. Long-term investments. And although we may apply a different set of filters, and we'll talk to that, this is the more common area. And your other speakers that have come here from other investment management firms would mostly talk to the long-term investment piece. We also do event-driven investments, distress credit investments, and then something that I don't think necessarily makes us unique, but we ha it, it gives us the ultimate flexibility is we can let money sit in cash if we can't find enough intelligent things to do. So that's the plank. I'm going to take you through this in a little bit more detail. Let's start with long-term investments. For us, it comes down to three things, and I'm going to bring all three questions in at, at, at once here. The prism we bring to any security that we're analyzing is, does this business possess outstanding business economics? Does it have honest and capable management? And can it be purchased at an attractive price? And, and I'm here to tell you, we don't do anything different than many others. Outstanding economics, we're looking for high returns on shareholder equity, good balance sheets, um, usually no debt or net cash after debt. Um, we're looking at growing revenues, earnings, free cash flow over a period of time. Not every year because no company is up year after year after year, but we want to see a pattern over time. Um, you know, maybe it's got brand power. Maybe it's the lowest cost producer of the product area. Um, you know, certainly we're looking at operating margins and, and, and gross margins and net margins and trying to understand what allows something to be a above average uh, business or what gives it a sustainable competitive advantage. And, you know, we were talking earlier um, certainly looking at the record is akin to looking out the rear view mirror. That tells you about the history. But the money's made by swiveling your head around and looking out the front windshield of the car and saying, okay, through the rear view mirror, we have a business that's very good. Will the future be any different than the past? And I'm here to tell you, you know, we've made our fair share of mistakes or what I call the wow, never saw that coming moment where, um, you know, a competitive advantage gets disintermediated or disrupted in some way. And, you know, there's lots of examples throughout history. And, and certainly we have some examples of some of the things we've done over the years. And, you, you know, but but it's 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 critical to try and think about, you know, why was it a good business? What will keep it an above average business? And then does it have honest and capable management? Um, I say to people all the time, I think that we've spent more time at Stacey Muirhead thinking about this than most investment firms. And I don't think we've spent enough time on it. Um, you, need, you need people who certainly have integrity, but you also need people who have skill. And one with the out without the other is actually uh, poison and will lead to, to, to no good. And then, you know, a subset of all that is we're looking for companies that think and act like owners on the same, or looking for managers, excuse me, who think and act like owners, you know, on exactly the same basis that we're owners in the business. And the best way to have someone think and act like an owner is to have that manager be an owner. And so we really, you know, a test is share ownership. And I'm not saying options can have a place uh, in, in a compensation plan, but options are not the same thing as owning shares. So we look for share ownership. We look for capital allocation skills. 
Um, can managers take that free cash flow that comes up and do the right things with it? And that may be investing back in their business to grow their business, or they may have reached a scale where it's appropriate to start um, returning that cash to shareholders through share repurchases and, and dividends. So something we look at, and then can it be purchased at an attractive price? Uh, we don't have any black box or anything that's any different from anybody else. We're looking at price earnings ratios and earnings yields and dividend yields and price to book value and, and all the same measurements that everybody else um, looks at. I have always found it helpful over the years to keep this mantra in mind. You know, even the world's greatest business is not a great investment if you pay too much for it. And I just find that phrase resonates with me and it helps me to, to think about the equation. So all that, um, there's nothing radical there, um, but you know we encapsulate it down to this simple phrase, we're looking for a great business run by great people available at a great price, or at least a reasonable price, if not a great price. So that's long-term investments. Let me spend a little bit of time on event-driven investing, and this is something that's maybe not as common. I will just say to you that Warren Buffett was an event-driven investor for you know, 35 of his 50 years as an investor. It's just been in the last decade to 15 years that he no longer does this because, quite frankly, Berkshire Hathaway is too large. Although, interestingly enough, in the fourth quarter of this year, they filed on a position in Monsanto, uh, which certainly qualifies as an event-driven investment. And so let me take you through. What's it about? Pursuit of profits from announced corporate events. Uh, you'll notice the emphasis on announced. We're not trying to guess about some company that's going to get taken over. We're only reacting and trying to make investments where that corporate event has been announced. And so mergers, recapitalization, spin-offs, um, liquidations, reorganizations, self-tender offers, these are all examples of corporate events that might set up an investment usually shorter term in nature, and we'll talk to that in a moment, that, that, is, um, that, that, that certainly qualifies as um, a, a value investment. And all of every event-driven investment comes down to essentially answering four questions. And I didn't, you know, invent these four questions. Um, you can go back and read through past Berkshire Hathaway annual reports or Ben Graham's writings, but I, I know for sure in 1988, Buffett wrote at some length about his arbitrage um, activity and he articulated these four questions. And essentially, it, you know, what is the probability that the event in question will in fact occur? How long is our money going to be tied up in this investment? And then the upside downside question, in other words, is there a chance that something still better can happen? And then what happens if something goes wrong or what's the downside if, if something uh, upsets the apple cart? What we like about this activity at our firm is we expect to profit regardless of the behavior of the stock market in most circumstances. So. Whether a company A takes over company B has nothing to do with whether the stock market's up or down a thousand points or two thousand points. And so we like that insulating effect uh, from the stock market. And, you know, if we've done our homework correctly, and occasionally we'll make a mistake, but if we've done our homework correctly, we expect to profit regardless of the behavior of the stock market. So let's talk very quickly to distressed credit investments. We don't distinguish between what's called high yield and still paying or already defaulted on the obligation but available at a very attractive price that's going to get reorganized in some fashion that will, will lead you to a profit. So, you know, the first 
part of it high yield. We're looking for high yield commitments that will continue to meet their interest or dividend obligations. But the reason by definition that that high yield um, commitment has such an attractive yield is that there's perceived or actual difficulties with the business or there's overall market weakness that's leading to that opportunity. And I'm not going to talk to a, a distressed credit investment tonight in, in the case studies I give you in a second, but when I was here last, which I think was 2010, we talked at some length about one of the distressed credit investments we did. So then the flip side of that is securities that have already defaulted on their obligations. And the key there is you're trying to understand what cash and securities you might receive in a reorganization. And, uh, you know, if you can buy that at 50 cents on the dollar, these things uh, tend to uh, take, you know, three to four years to resolve. And so it can be a good rate of return if you do it correctly. And similarly to event-driven investments, results tend to be insulated from the behavior of the overall market. And so we like those insulating effects and uh, we think it allows us to keep the investment ball rolling forward um, through thick and thin. So that's distressed credit, cash and other net assets. I really don't have much to say. It's a parking spot. So we're not trying to make you know, great returns from our cash. It's just a temporary parking spot till we can find opportunities in the other three categories to deploy capital. So minimizing credit and interest rate risk is the key consideration for us. And then, you know, I get asked about the other net assets piece, you know, from time to time, there may be various risk mitigation tools or strategies that we can undertake um, that we've been able to identify at a reasonable cost. I, I, it's not a big part of our business, but it's certainly lumped in there. So that's that's the four categories. I want to just talk for a moment about our investment performance because you're you're you're. I'm here at a time where we actually have been struggling a little bit lately. So I, I, I want to, you know, in all fairness and full disclosure and candor, uh, um, let you see that because, you know, as professional investment managers, you don't always just knock the cover off the ball and outperform markets uh, each and every year. So, so what does that look like? So since our, and I'll bring all three uh, measurements in here. So since our, inception where the red line the blue lines the market and the yellow line is the risk-free rate of return or it, it essentially approximates uh inflation so you can see there on that chart you know we've lagged in the last couple of years and that's only the second time in our 23 year history where we've been behind the other time was the 1999 2000 tech bubble um, where we fell behind but after that tech bubble broke and you know at the time we were looking at securities and they had no revenue and no earnings and were trading at market capitalizations bigger than you know the bank of montreal or uh, and you know i distinctly remember buying more berkshire hathaway shares for our portfolio on valentine's day in the year 2000 um, you may think i have a strange life with that statement i choose not to to dwell on that but on valentine's day and i i, I remember you know distinctly that at that time you were buying shares in berkshire hathaway for less than the value of the securities portfolio, less all liabilities, and you were getting the wholly owned businesses that Berkshire owned at that point, which were considerable. Things like the Buffalo News, Seas Candies, Dairy Queen, uh, to, to name just three, for essentially less than zero. And you know, we were scratching our head and saying like, boy, the world's just, seems a little goofy right now you know pets.com or you know grocery gateway is selling for billions and billions and has no revenues and earnings and here we can buy 
you know, Berkshire Hathaway for the value of the securities and get these wonderful wholly owned businesses thrown in for, for nothing. Well, it, it turns out we weren't wrong. And, uh, you know, after the tech bubble broke, you can see there we had one of our uh, biggest sustained periods of outperformance in our history. And here we are, you know, in the last 18 months, uh, back again, below the line, if you will. So I would just say to you, first of all, that blue line, the slope of that line's pretty severe, and I would argue not sustainable. And, you know, earlier this week, Snap uh, went public at, you know, I don't know how many billions of dollars, um, you know, and you, you just have a lot of really goofy things going on in markets from a valuation perspective. And so here we are. So from my chair, um, and again, I'm not here trying to sell you something, but certainly the message I would, would give to our existing investors or potential new investors is we've been here before. I believe this represents more of an opportunity than a problem. And, you know, I have asked our investors that, should they see it similarly, it might be a good, uh, perhaps a good opportunity to entrust additional capital to our care. And, uh, you know, we'll see if we're right or not, but I just want to be totally forthright and honest about where our track record is today. By the way, I, I would make the comment, you know, the red line is going up and, uh, you know, it's just not going up at the same rate as the market has the last few years. And I, I maybe should have commented, you know, although the chart there doesn't maybe do it justice in 2008, 2009, uh, you know, we dropped a lot less than the market overall. Um, the one outlier in our 23 year history is 2011. Um, and you can see that that's the second dip. And we did in fact fall more than markets that year and that was uncharacteristic for us and yeah we made some mistakes and that's uh, operator error on our part but in a 23 year history um, you know although you would hope it doesn't happen at all I don't think one bad year uh, of operator error is necessarily a bad track record so all that I have one more slide to show you on performance I think one of the things and it, it relates in part to the multi-strategy approach that we talked about. But one of the things that's really distinguished our firm over the years, I think, is risk management. And we, I would like to think we manage risk very well. And my definition, uh, like Ben Graham, like Warren Buffett, is not volatility, but of prices, but whether you're permanently impairing capital. And if you accept that view, then I think it also logically follows that the time where investors are most likely to impair capital is during severe declines in markets. And, you know, Buffett has this wonderful expression, it's only when the tide goes out that you see who's swimming naked. And, you know, that encapsulates this quite, quite well. And so let me try and give you a data point here. So to the end of December, our original fund has been around 23 years. We had 20 up years, three down years, uh, versus 17 up years for the market and six down years. Or said another way, we had half the number of down years that the market had over our operating history. In those up market years, so those 17 years the market was up, it was up on average 15.9%. This is just a simple average. You can't compound the string just looking at it as a simple average. In those same uh, 17 years, we were up 11.4. So we tend to lag in good times and make sure that we're not taking on uh, inordinate amounts of risk or silly amounts of risk. But then in down years, that's when we thrive on a relative basis. So in those six years, the market was down. It averaged down 12.9%. We were only down 2.93%. Or expressing that middle third of the chart in a different way, we get about 72% of the upside, 
but we also only take 22% of the downside. And so we would like to think that that's um, a good uh, track record of managing risk for our clients. And you know what I try to tell our investors is we want them to both eat well and sleep well. And uh, so I think you know we've done, uh, maybe we could do a little better job on the eating part, but we've certainly done a, a fabulous job on, on the sleeping part over the years. So that's all I wanted to say about performance. I just felt I needed... To, to put that into context for you. So again, you can understand the framework from which I'm, I'm you know, we, we, we make investments for our clients. So managing risk. So let's just briefly go back to this multi-strategy approach. I thought it might be interesting to take you through a couple of event-driven investments. Um, Happy to talk in Q&A about our long-term investments or any of our other part of our investment operation. But I thought just because this is maybe something that you don't see every day and is this little um, side pocket of the value investing craft, you, 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 might, you might enjoy it. So um, to set this up a little bit, I have two examples. Because the problem, of course, with event-driven investing from an explanatory point of view is that they're short-term or relatively short-term in nature. So I'm going to show you one that's completed and done, that was done in the last year or so. Um, of course, just to give you a sense that, you know, I'm not cherry-picking something, I also need to show you one that's in progress and lay out for you our assumptions about what we think we can make um, from that event-driven investment. And of course, only the fullness of time will, will tell whether we're correct or not. And so you can, if you have an interest, you can follow the one that's on the, uh, on the go and, and see, um, see how, how smart we are or how dumb we are, depending on how it turns out. So first case study um, was the purchase of precision cast parts by Berkshire Hathaway. And I chose this one deliberately. It, ha it closed um, a little over a year ago um, because normally you don't get an opportunity to make an investment in something that, that Warren Buffett's buying because the spread tends to be unattractive and for a, a variety of well known reasons, the quality of his, of, of his track record of closing transactions, his, his financing capability, et cetera. But let me walk you through this one. So what, are the basic, what were the basic transaction details? Well, on August 10th of 2015, Berkshire Hathaway announced a definitive agreement to acquire precision cast parts. The price was to be $235 a share in cash. Um, you also were going to get quarterly dividends until closing. Now, Precision Cast Parts only paid, you know, three cents a quarter. So on a two, $235 stock, it's not a big part of the equation. But um, just for the record, you were going to keep getting quarterly dividends. What distinguishes virtually every Berkshire Hathaway transaction is there's no financing condition. In other words, I don't have to raise financing. I've got the money. I'll close. And so he doesn't put in any condition into these transactions about, you know, oh, I need to raise financing. And if I can't raise the financing, I don't have to close on the transaction. Big consideration. And we'll come back to that. Um, in all these transactions, there's always various regulatory approvals you have to get. Um, usually, the, the, the main ones are around uh, anti-competitive uh, uh, activity. And so, in the United States, what's called HSR, Hart Scott Rodino Act approval, was required. And then there was other foreign competition bureau or agency clearances that were required. And we'll, we'll talk more to that in a moment. Um, Precision uh, needed to get uh, 
shareholder approval. At the time the deal was announced, you didn't know when that meeting date was going to be, but it subsequently turned out to be November. Um, so the deal was announced in October. You know, it takes time to get these documents out uh, uh, in connection with the deals. And there's certain prescribed time periods that have to um, have to be observed before you can call a shareholder meeting. So in any event, the meeting was set for November 19th. And the expected closing at the time they put out or made the announcement, they expected to close in the first quarter of 2016. So what were the things and what were the considerations that led us to make that investment in precision cast parts? And let me just say, when the announcement happened in August, as is typical for Berkshire Hathaway deals, the spread closed up very, very tightly and you could only make a 4% annualized rate of return based on the numbers they were giving you. We're not going to play the game for a 4% rate of return. We need to have something higher than that. But part of our process is we monitor all these deals and we follow these deals. And sometimes intra-transaction, you, you know, for whatever reason, the spread opens up and you, you may get an opportunity to, to act. So just ask you to bear that in mind as I lay this all out. So what were the things we're thinking about? Well, certainly... When Berkshire Hathaway makes an offer, they close. I mean, they have virtually 100% track record for closing. So, you know, you had a high degree of probability that they would close this transaction. And, of course, part of that was the no financing condition that we talked about earlier. It was a premium price that you were getting. The stock was essentially, the price he was paying was... Not an all-time high, but virtually an all-time high on the shares. So you have a higher degree of confidence that shareholders are going to go along with it. And so, you know, part of that premium price that gives you confidence that the shareholders will vote in favor of the transaction. Um, we had not yet purchased shares. And so on October 5th, you got Hart Scott Rodino Act approval. So the anti-competitive body said, we don't have a problem with this transaction, we approve it. Now, there were still foreign clearances to get, but most of Precision's business was in the United States. Berkshire's located in the United States. If you get Hart Scott Act of Rodino Act approval, HSR Act approval, usually the other ones follow along in, in due course. Um, Shareholder approval was received on November uh, 19th. Now, as you'll see in a moment, we bought a few shares before the 19th and then shares after the 19th. So what I want you to think about here is, you know, the risk is decreasing every time one of these milestones is met. It's not increasing, it's decreasing. So, you know, shareholders have approved it. Oh, Hart Scott approval is in. So as all these milestones come in, your risk is reducing. So for the record, you know, November 19th, shareholders approved the deal. There were some remaining foreign competition approvals, but they seemed routine to us. And then I, I don't want to hit this one uh, too hard, but Precision had experienced financial advisors. I Sorry, I can't recall. I think it was Morgan Stanley was the uh, investment banker, and they had name brand law firms. Of course, what makes Berkshire Hathaway so interesting is they don't use advisors. You know, Warren just does his own thing, and he had his usual law firm, Munger, Tolls, and Olson, helping him with the, with the legal piece of the transaction. So... Those were kind of the background things. How did this all turn out? So for us, we, you know, you were going to receive cash of $235 a share if this worked out. Um, remember I said there was a quarterly dividend of three cents. It worked out for us kind of two cents because we got a dividend on part of what we purchased and part of uh, we did not receive a dividend because we bought it after the date of the last dividend. So I, I know that seems kind of weird, but in any event, you know, the dividend was just such a minor piece of it all. So we paid all in, in three separate 
transactions, $231.20 to purchase our shares. Um, so that was a, a spread of $3.82 a share or 1.65%. Okay, you're maybe sitting there saying, well, that doesn't sound so great, but it's the time that we had this investment. So we purchased shares as early as November 9th. Remember, that was before the shareholder approval. And then we purchased on two occasions in January of 16, the latest being January 20th. So this transaction actually closed January 29th. It took us till, you know, February 2nd, I believe, to get our capital because there's always a slight delay from closing to when you receive your capital. <laughs> but the weighted average holding period for our capital was 54 days. So that 1.65% over 54 days is really 11% 0.17% annualized. And I would just say to you, you know, for a deal that had the quality of this one, um, you know, we thought that was um, a pretty attractive rate of return. You know, I, I joked with some of our investors at the time that I thought this was safer than treasury bills. But at the time, treasury bills were you know, half a percent annualized or a quarter of a percent annualized, and this we could get, you know, over 11% annualized. So that's factual. That was our actual experience in a transaction. Let's look at one that's unfolding right now, and I'll take you through what our assumptions are about timing and, and, and all that sort of thing, and, and, and then, you know, We'll see how it all turns out in a, in, in a few months' time. So Johnson & Johnson is buying a Swiss pharmaceutical company called Actelion. So what are the details? The definitive agreement was announced on January 26th uh, for J&J &J to acquire Actelion. What are you going to get? You're going to get 280 US dollars per share in cash, plus one share in a new R&D spinoff company. And I'll talk more to that in a minute. Um, just to make this analysis simple, I haven't you know, done the exchange between Swiss francs and US dollars because the, the time, the two days on which we bought shares, the US dollar and the Swiss franc were essentially at par. So just to make this simple, even though Actelion's quoted in Swiss francs and you're gonna get $280, just remember we basically bought in US or US dollar equivalent for Actelion because there was essentially no differential between the Swiss franc and the US dollar. As is typical in many deals, there's a minimum acceptance rate, so two-thirds, 67% uh, of the shares have to get tendered or Johnson & Johnson doesn't have to go ahead. Um, competition clearances required from the U.S., the European Commission, Japan, Russia, Israel, and Turkey. Uh, that one struck me as unusual, but that's... Uh, certainly one of the countries that has to approve this from a competition point of view. As is typical, and we didn't talk about this with precision cast parts because, again, uh, uh, something that lowers the risk is uh, Berkshire Hathaway, when they buy something, they don't have material adverse event. They, we want it. We're willing to buy. There's no circumstances on which we can walk from this transaction. I jokingly refer to material adverse conditions or material adverse events as the standard weasel clauses that all companies employ when they want to buy something. So in this particular case, Johnson & Johnson has said that, and, and was agreed to as part of the deal, that if the earnings before interest and tax drop by 15%, or the sales drop by more than 10% based on 2015 calendar year sales, then that will constitute a material adverse event and Johnson & Johnson can walk from the transaction. So keep... 
Well, that's a standard. So in this case, remember, this is a, a drug company, George. So what, ha and we're going to talk to that, actually. There's a drug that uh, there's some concern about maybe the regulators are going to pull it off the market. And so that might uh, represent a material adverse event. Hold on. I, I think I can make this a little more real for you in just a second. Um, so the companies have said they expect to close by the end of the second quarter. Um, we're using June 15th, um, although I would label that as something more than guesswork. I mean, I don't want to be held to account that June 15th is the date this transaction will close. Things can happen, but, you know, we think it, you know, based on what needs to get done and our, our sense of what all the um, various milestones are that have to get met, that they can probably do this by June 15th. So what are the key considerations? Like the Berkshire deal, big risk reducer, Johnson & Johnson has no financing condition. Now, they have uh, the money sitting in cash. And you know one of the attractions to Johnson & Johnson was they have a lot of money overseas that they can't bring back to the United States. And so here was an opportunity to buy a Swiss pharmaceutical company. So this transaction is going to uh, require about $30 billion to close. They have the $30 billion already available, sitting in Europe, ready to go. So that's a big risk reducer. Um, like precision cast parts, this was a premium price. This is actually an all-time high. Um, for Actelion. So you, you, you would say, all right, you would think the shareholders would go for this, that they wouldn't object that it's an inferior price or an unacceptable price. And certainly the CEO himself, who owns 5% of this company, has entered into a lockup agreement saying, I agree to tender my shares to Johnson & Johnson. This transaction was well shopped before an agreement was reached and there were multiple bidders. Um, so that gives you some assurance that if something does happen and the deal doesn't consummate, that maybe you resurrect some of the other bidders and they come forward. Um, now, it might be at somewhat of a lower price, but that, that you have some downside protection. And in this case, you know, Santa Fe was a well- uh, well known and publicly identified that they had made bids and had made offers to buy the company, but at the end of the day, Johnson and Johnson was willing to to offer more. Um, so then, the other thing, of course, you need to think about is what might this new R and D company that you're going to get? What might that you know what what might that be valued at and as part of this equation? And so, this is kind of one of the tougher parts of this transaction, but also one of the more interesting parts of this transaction. Um, we don't have a lot of, so maybe should back up and give you some context. Um, the CEO of Actelion was quite adamant in driving this structure. What Johnson & Johnson wanted was the established drugs that Actelion is already selling. Um, and the CEO was concerned that all this wonderful R&D that Actelion had been doing would get shelved. And so he was adamant that he wanted a separate structure where the early stage R&D pipeline work would be set aside into a new company. He's going with the new company as CEO. And so we're trying to think about what, you know, what might that be worth? And that piece will be publicly traded. Um, and so what, you know, what might be a fair valuation for that? So let me just give you a couple of data points. So Johnson & Johnson is putting 290 million Swiss francs into this new uh, R&D company for a 16% interest. So that values the whole company. If, if you just said, okay, that's fair value, that's a little over $1.8 billion or $14.5 per share based on what will be a little over 125 million shares outstanding. We know there's going to be $8 Swiss francs uh, per share in cash on day one. 
when this transaction closes. That's made up of the $290 million that, that Johnson & Johnson's putting in. Um, they're also putting in a further $290 million for a 16% convertible note interest. And then Actelion is contributing um, cash as well to the new R&D company, but it'll be about $8 Swiss franc. Now, don't be misled. You know, there's going to be a burn on this cash because they're an R&D company. And so they're they're going to be spending that cash over a period of time. But, you know, day one, it'll have $8 a share in cash. And then what we don't really have a good handle on is, you know, what all what all possibilities are in this early stage pipeline. And I'll be quite candid. We don't have a lot of information to go on. As you get closer to the consummation date, the new R&D company will have to provide more information about that. But what gives me comfort is the CEO wants to go with the new R&D company rather than staying with Actelion. So certainly he believes there's some very promising uh, new drugs there. So just a few data points to think about valuation. And George, now this goes back to the the issue. So potential Uptravi issue. So Uptravi is one of the existing drugs that Actelion sells. And in January, just prior to the announcement of the deal, the French medical regulators um, put out a uh, letter to all physicians in France saying that we have some data here that we find somewhat troubling and that uh, there's been some deaths and we're not saying it's related to Uptravi, but certainly the deaths have happened uh, to patients that have been on Uptravi. And so we're not ordering a recall. We're not ordering physicians to stop prescribing Uptravi to existing patients but we are asking that you don't issue any new prescriptions for new, uh, new patients on Uptravi. So this got the marketplace or investors all fussed, and uh, not without, you know, not without some validity. And so in 2015, um, Uptravi sales worldwide were about 160 million, which was about. Seven eight percent of Actelion's total sales. So remember, we talked about ten percent of sales being a material adverse event. Now we only have France stepping forward. The largest market is the United States for Uptravi. We've had no indication that the American medical regulators, the FDA, um, have any any issues with the drug at this point. And the other thing that gives me some confidence is Johnson & Johnson came out with a public statement after this came out that there was this problem and said, look, we were aware of this when we made the bid. Even though it was early January that they did this, it only came out in the public uh, for public scrutiny after the deal was announced. And so Johnson & Johnson clarified that situation. So. I'm not trying to make light of this as a as an event-driven investor. It's certainly something you need to think about and take into consideration. But my sense is that this isn't a big problem. And my further sense is that before you could have the data to actually substantiate this, it's highly likely that the transaction will have already closed. So that gives me some confidence, but I, I, I want to put it in the proper context for you. It is definitely something you should think about. So expected return analysis, as opposed to the last one where I could show you exactly what we made, um, what's this one look like? So we're going to get $280 in cash if this transaction closes. You know, I don't care how you get there. You say, well, it's only $4 in cash after a burn, but the pipeline's worth $4. Remember, j and J's paying the equivalent of $14.5 a share. So I've plugged in eight. I should maybe just stop and make a comment at this point. Um, the more time I spend on this R&D company, the more excited I get about it. And let me try and put this to you contextually. So the CEO of Actelion owns 5% of Actelion today. He's going to get approximately a billion and a half dollars for his 
5% interest and he will get 5% of the new R&D company. In Switzerland, there's no capital gains tax. So he's going to essentially put a billion and a half in his pocket. Using the Johnson & Johnson price of 14 and a half, sorry, excuse me, that's not quite correct. Using the $8 cash price per share, essentially... He could double his interest in this R&D company for taking 90 million of his 1.5 billion. He could double his interest. Think about all these shareholders that have been longtime Actelian shareholders saying, you know, this CEO, he's a winner. I'm going to take some of my cash and put it into this new R&D company. So I, I, you know, I think you just have to be realistic about it, but I think there's at least a possibility that this stub company, this R&D company, that as of yet doesn't even have a name, that's why we have to keep referring to it as new R&D company, um, you know, could actually be valued in the marketplace um, at, a, at a pretty fancy number. But for purposes of this discussion, I'm just using $8, which... I would like to think as a conservative number. This I know, it will trade for something. You know, it won't trade for zero the day after it uh, gets listed for public trading. So, over two days, which I'll show you in a minute, we paid two hundred and sixty-eight dollars and seventy cents in Swiss franc equivalent, but it was basically par. If we get, you know, two hundred and eighty, and we get eight dollars. Um, you know, our gross profits, $19.30 or seven, almost 7.2%. We purchased over two days on January 30th and February 1st. If our closing date of June 15th is correct, um, that will be a weighted average holding period of 135 days. And we'll get a return of 19.4% annualized. So I just put that in gold because obviously... We don't know that's how this is going to turn out and something can go wrong. It can go right, but it can take longer to close. Um, it could be better than that because it closes sooner. Um, but, you know, those are my best estimates. And based on our experience over the years in doing these types of transactions, we think that's um, a pretty representative and, and conser likely conservative rate of return. So those are examples. Let me let me just wrap up before I throw it open to questions. So what, you know, just to recap, like what are the benefits of doing this event-driven investing? You know, returns depend on transaction completion and not on the movement in equity markets. And you know, your long-term investments you can have great investments, but if the market goes down a thousand points, I guarantee you they're going to go down too, at least for a while. Now, it may per create an opportunity, but what I like about event driven is that it's dependent on the transaction completion, not on the movement in markets. Most of these transactions are uncorrelated with each other. I mean, you know, I didn't give you two that are on on the go at the same time. But imagine if Precision Cast Parts was playing out today. You know, whether Precision Cast Parts closes has nothing to do with that, the Actelion J and J transaction closing. So they're uncorrelated with each other. Short completion times lead to cash availability. So imagine we woke up in May and markets were down a lot. You know, we would expect to get our cash in June and we could then deploy that to long term investments that at that point might be available at, at really attractive prices. So we like that part of it. Multi strategy benefits. I, I just say it adds another page to our investment playbook. And I think that's important. It gives you more things to do. But I think it's also important in a behavioral way. Like sometimes what happens to all of us as investors is we can't find things to do in our, let's use long-term investments. So you don't realize you're doing this, but you lower your standards and you, you 
what you wouldn't have done now you do because you got all this cash and 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 so you 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 make investments so i like this idea of having more than one page in our investment playbook and it's it's served us well over the years and good information availability and transparency like part of what i love about this biz, about the event driven business is that you just read the documents you know what are the terms and conditions of the transaction? And you try and put it in a framework of, you know, what probability will this happen? But all the information is available to everyone in public filings and the transparency is really good on these things. So we, we, we like that. You don't have to make the same kind of judgments about, you know, what will, what will this new product do for company X, you know, five years from today? So I like that information availability and transparency. But what are the risks? Let's be fair and talk about both sides of the equation. So transactions can break for many reasons, and I hope you got a flavor of that. Um, here's just, um, you know, not an all-inclusive list, but certainly some of the biggies, financing issues. You know, in the case of the two case studies I laid out for you tonight, there were no financing conditions, so that was good. You know, shareholders reject an offer as being inadequate. Um, you know, regulatory concerns, uh, so the medical regulators in the case of the Optravi issue could could derail a transaction. Antitrust regulators, um, certainly always an issue and then in most transactions you didn't have it in the berkshire hathaway transaction but in most transactions there is a material adverse event clause um, so you need to be cognizant of what can go wrong in these transactions and then i just say you know one of the risks any single transaction is a binary event you know here it happens or it doesn't happen and you know you can do what you can do to you know, put probability and good odds on your side in terms of a collection of these event-driven investments, but any single one is a binary event. And so a, a good batting average is required. You know, in most of these transactions, the downside's greater than the upside. So you need to make sure that you have a high batting average or it's not going to work for you. So that's event-driven investments. Happy to take your questions. I always invoke the Yogi Berra clause. If I've embarrassed myself up here and said something, I, I, I really didn't say everything I said. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll take your questions. Does the quality of the target is a consideration that is do you ever think that if this fails, I'm still going to hold on to the company? Yeah. Or you get out and uh, say, no, it failed, I'm going to get out now. Look no, on. no. In actual fact, um, uh, that's a big part um, where you get some comfort in this business is that exactly that situation where, okay, if this deal breaks, you know, what might it go down to? And at that point in time, what's that look like from a valuation perspective? And, you know, I'll, I'll give you a current example right now, Monsanto, which um, we're in the Monsanto deal. Bayer is taking over Monsanto. There's huge concerns. Um, I, I would add certainly justified that, you know, the regulators will not approve this transaction. So the spread is huge. You know, it, up until just the last couple of weeks, it's gone up somewhat. But, it, you know, you could buy it at basically $100 and you're going to get 128 you know, I'm saying by September. But, you know, a big part of our thinking was, you know, at 100 you know, with dividends, you've got give or take $30 in upside. But the low price on the shares, you know, at the at at the low point in January, February of 2016 was 85. So, you know, I may be wrong, but I sort of said, okay, that's kind of your downside. So you got twice as much upside as you do downside in this case. In and at that point, Monsanto uh, would receive a two billion dollar break fee, and if they just took that money and bought back stock at 85 dollars, they'd be able to buy. You know, about five and a half percent of the total shares outstanding with two billion. Maybe they'd add more capital to that, but 
you know, take the break fee, buy back shares. That'd be about five and a half percent of the shares outstanding. And at that point, you would have a company that's trading at 12 times peak earnings from 2015 or kind of 15 times, you know, expected or company estimates of what they would expect to make, you know, adjusted for a reduced number of shares outstanding. So that that gives you some comfort that, you know, if it breaks, you know, you could always buy more shares at that point and, you know, ride it out. And, and so that is absolutely, George, um, uh, something that we think about a lot. In the case, interestingly enough, in the case of Actelion, in that example, you know, one of the biggest things you worry about is for whatever reason, if this deal goes away, this one's got a lot of, a lot of downside and that scares some people. You know, we just think the quality of J&J &J as a buyer on the other side offsets a lot of that. But I mean, if it breaks, yeah, it'll, it'll be a, a toe stubbing for us. So, so definitely we think about that a lot. Um, yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming. It was a lovely pre presentation. Um, my question uh, is about the event driven investments. I was just wondering how much time do you devote in your day to day to these types of events? And also, how much money from your total pool of funds or as a percentage do you devote to event driven investments versus long term investments? Yeah. So the answer is it, it varies. Con depending on the period of time. So I'll take the latter one first. You know, over our history, we've been anywhere from zero in event-driven investments to as high as about 45% um, of our total portfolio. So um, that's a tough question to answer because, you know, as activity, so the amount of time spent, you know, as activity picks up and there's more opportunities, Obviously, you're spending more time uh, going through the documents. I think one of the things we've gotten at least reasonably proficient at over the years is, you know, what's boilerplate and what's the meat um, in these documents and also what deals um, do you just go into the too hard pile or the discard pile right off the hop without even spending um, any time on them. And I'll give you one example of that. You know, um, Walgreens made an offer for Rite Aid that's just been going on and going on and they couldn't get regulatory approval. Then the regulars said if you sell uh, a number of stores, but it's got to be to one buyer. So then they found one buyer, but there's question whether that buyer can close. Then Walgreen came back and reduced the offer. And, you know, we just never even spent any time on it because we just thought, I stand to be corrected on this, but I think you were putting the largest and third largest uh, retail drugstore chain together in the United States. We just thought it was, quite frankly, likely to run into some regulatory problems we could have been wrong certainly and you know the spread was was very wide and attractive and um, so if it would have happened uh, that would have been you know we would have left money on the table but I, I think you over time you get you get a sense of uh, where you want to play and where you don't play and the only other comment I, I think and you didn't ask this but I, th I think it's relevant to sort of the weighting and the discussion um, we run a fairly concentrated portfolio on the inv long-term investment side, and we also run, I mean, by definition, you have to be cognizant of the risk in event-driven, and so you probably run at weightings that are somewhat lower than you might run in long-term investments. But by the standards of many event-driven investors, we run a very concentrated event-driven portfolio as well relative to most and uh, so you know when we stub our toe it's not going to look pretty and that's just part of the part of the territory but again you know we've had a very good batting average we've been um, you know 90 percent plus success rate over over 23 years and so um, we think it's uh, we think the math and the risk reward trade-offs work, but you know we try to we try to 
where we have a lot of confidence in something. And so for perspective, you know, Actelion's about 6% of our overall portfolio today. Now, I may be revealing how silly we are, in fact, uh, I, I don't know. But, you know, we've just always done it that way and, and try to have, we would have a much greater uh, concentration even in our event driven, you know, like professional arbitrage firms that do only arbitrage, they might have 50 deals, 60 deals, 70 deals on the go at any one time. I mean, we certainly, at our firm, we don't have the horsepower to do that. But secondly, it's, it's kind of not the way we want to live our lives. And so when we find something that we're comfortable with from a risk reward perspective in the event driven, we, we tend to concentrate at least relative to the standards of other event driven investors. So I, I know that is quite what you asked, but uh, zero to 45 and it depends how much time it takes uh, based on your opportunity set at any one point in time. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Thanks very much for your great presentation. So my question is, um, in order to make a well-informed investment decision, we like to get a sense of uh, we know better than the market. So in the case of event-driven investments, how do you make sure that you know better than the market? <laughs> that, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure... Uh, that we do have that sense necessarily for us it's just probabilistic thinking i mean certainly over time you know i i would like to think we've gotten an experience level around you know as i mentioned earlier disregarding certain deals out of hand because you know it, it's too close to the line in terms of it being approved um but Again, you know, for me, what um, separate from all the return aspect of this, what I really like about event driven is that I think if you just sit down and plow through the documents, like, you know, what you need to make a decision is in the public documents related to the transaction at hand. And so I, I find that very attractive and I don't know what other firms do maybe they're not doing um, the work on the front end that that we are um, but we just I, I also think the multi-strategy aspect or the more than one page page in your playbook works in our favor going the other way and what I mean by that is if you're an arbitrage firm and all you do is arbitrage and you're not in the long-term investment business or the distress business or you can't you, you know the mandate to your your funds or your accounts are that you can't keep the money in cash I think you know having other things in our playbook allows us to pass on the ones that might be marginal or perhaps you know resist that behavioral tendency to to march down the quality scale that I alluded to on the investment side of the piece. So I think that's probably uh, the biggest considerations in it all. But why, why, why not everybody do, does this? I mean, why, if so risk-free, why the gap should exist? And I mean, why, if more people do this, then the gap will disappear. Why does it disappear? Well, interestingly enough, so one of the things in the, the Actelion situation, um, and, and I'm making a speculative comment now because I, I can't really track flows of capital and I'm not sure anyone can. But because this was a widely um, shopped and, and widely in the press as a rumor before you finally got to the consummation or, or the, the announcement of a definitive agreement by Johnson & Johnson. Interestingly enough, it attracted a lot of the arbitrage event-driven community early on. And so they've actually done very well because they were in and, you know, the final price was an all-time high. And so I think a lot of the natural um, buyers for Actelion are actually sellers at the moment. And of course, because it was such a high premium, if you have 
a bunch of the natural buyers from the event-driven community not there. You have what always happens in these transactions is long-time existing shareholders say, I just don't want to deal with the risk of that last 7% in this case, and so I'm just going to sell because I've made a lot of money. So I think there was probably a disproportionate amount of selling pressure, and so that spread was wider or is wider, was wider, than it otherwise would have been. Now, that's just a speculative comment on my part, and I can't um, substantiate that. But, um, you know, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's just these things. It's something that requires a bit of a skill set that you can develop over a period of time. I mean, all I can say is, you know, we've been doing it for... For 23 years, Warren Buffett did it for 35 years, 40 years, and uh, you know it just seems to be this anomaly that exists. But again, remember when a transaction breaks, it can also um, it can be ugly, and so you need to take that into account. You know, we felt that you know where we get around that problem is a lot of times dedicated event-driven management firms, they would say, well, there's no deal anymore, so we have to sell, you know, and get on to the next thing, whereas we can let that turn into a long-term investment position if we think it's attractive and maybe, in fact, double down into the lower price. So I think we have have some ways of um, perhaps mitigating some of the risks that others don't have at their disposal, which is something that's been a, a huge advantage for us. And again, it comes back to that multi-strategy benefit. But um, it's, it's one of life's mysteries. I mean, Ben Graham, if you read the Intelligent Investor Security Analysis, I mean, he talks about, um, you know, they called it I mean, Warren Buffett originally called it, you know, arbitrage and workout situations. Um, you know, then it became risk arbitrage. Now it's event driven. I mean, it's all the same thing. But, you know, Ben Graham talked about it. So one of those mysteries um, as to why there can be spreads. Um, you know, I, it's not a mystery that there's a greater spread than short term treasury bills because you don't have risk in short term treasury bills and you're taking on a risk in an event-driven arb, but I just think in in many cases you're getting compensated to take that risk. And the key is is just having a knowledge base and some experience and maybe some scar tissue uh, to teach you, you know, what's the right ones to 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 go after and which ones to avoid. So I know that's a long-winded answer to a very direct question uh, that maybe didn't actually answer your question. Um, hi, sir. Thank you for coming for the great speech. Um, my question is based on current market condition. So as we all know, um, currently TSX is at all-time high. And as a value investor, um, the principle, I guess, is buy low, sell high. And would you consider this as an alert to reduce your position in the current market based on current market condition, or is there a strategy that you can take advantage that if there is an incoming, you know, like sharp drop off of the market yeah. in both the you know, U.S. and Canada? Yeah. So I'll 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 take a a cut at that a a, a couple of different ways. I mean, first of all, in aggregate. I agree with you. You know, um, the S and P 500s at 25 times trailing earnings. Um, you know, the value line estimated earnings going forwards at basically an all-time high at 19 times. Um, you know, market cap to GDPs at 131. I mean, that's a measure Buffett actually wrote about. You know, 15 years, 16 years ago, is saying you know the most reliable indicator of you know market valuations of course interest rates are low right now so all things being equal you could argue that markets should trade at higher multiples and you know that's the conundrum and the rub that we all wrestle with and of course the elephant in the room is what happens if interest rates are are headed higher and i'm not talking about the incessant 
CNBC and Bloomberg debate about the next quarter point move in in interest rates and will the Fed go or not go but you know what if we're on our way to five over a period or six or whatever number you choose over a period of time because inflation is picking up the economy's picking up and I don't particularly have a strong view one way or the other other than to say you know if interest rates are headed up in a substantive degree that exerts all things being equal downward pressure on valuations so you know we think about that all the time at our firm but again that's why i wanted to present event driven to you tonight because i think it's a place where um, to the extent that you get opportunities to deploy capital where you can run and hide because it avoids the overall market valuation or where interest rates are going it's dependent on one thing and one thing only will the transaction will that event in fact uh, be consummated so it's a place to run and hide um, the only other comment i would make and i know he was a longtime supporter of the ben graham center um, before he passed away good friend of george's and a good friend of mine peter cundell um, you know and he always had the expression there's always something to do and so you know in a uh, 25 times s p 500 market you know if i can find a business that you know has unbelievable financial characteristics meaning all those things we talked about high returns on shareholder capital great balance sheet growing revenue and earnings run by people i respect who have their money up and it's trading at 10 to 12 times earnings or free cash flow or whatever you know measurements you want to use um, there's always something to do and so i have to deploy capital to that opportunity even though I may be concerned about overall valuations in the market, and at least I can then content myself that, you know, I've got a much cheaper security, so all things being equal in a market wipeout, you know, it should drop less. And then, you know, maybe the other dollop to your question is, of course, um, you know, it, to the extent that you have cash reserves, you know, market corrections give you opportunities to deploy more capital um, in the case of our main fund that i showed you tonight you know we can leverage our other fund we can't not that we're big leverage type investors but you know if i woke up tomorrow and you know just using that s p 500 measurement we went from 25 times to 12 times for the overall market i, I guarantee you we're going to be active and we're going to find some things to do and we may even leverage ourselves a little bit to get there and um you know and and work that off over time hopefully we could attract some new capital uh, to our funds or or what have you but you know we would certainly be active so that's the art form of it all like there's no magic um, formula that you can say okay if this happens then we're going to do that you just have to roll with the punches and so you know uh, to, to summarize I, yeah I, I worry every day about valuations overall I don't think things are cheap they're only not expensive if interest rates stay low for a considerable period of time and uh but on the other side there's always something to do um thank you just a quick follow-up um would you consider ever use options and derivatives to leverage yourself up in under the condition if there is a huge drop in the market thank you um we we haven't tended to be big players in options um or derivatives from time to time we have done some things but you know part of my reservation is not only do you have to be right directionally then you also have to be right on time and uh you know i it's tough enough being right directionally i tend not to want to throw a, the added pressure of being right as to time but again having you know flexibility is such a big part i think of being um a, a good investor and 
and so you can't rule it out, but I have to be honest with you, it hasn't been a big area um, for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You talked about having a global perspective. Uh, value investing is based on market inefficiencies, and by nature, developing markets would have greater market inefficiency. So does Stacey Muirhead invest in any developing countries? And if yes, then what is the filtering criteria? Yeah, um, we have done some things in China over the years. Um, uh, candidly, it hasn't been as successful as some of the other things that we've done. Um, we are... Our largest um, shareholding, our largest long-term investment shareholding um, is, is Fairfax Financial. Fairfax Financial started a, an Indian venture called Fairfax India that we participated in. And so right off the top, you'll recall I said, you know, you know it's an aspiration to be global. And yes, I think we are global in the sense that, you know, we're in... I'm sorry, I can't tell you how many countries I'd have to think think this through, but in multiple countries and continents around the world, but but it's also evolutionary. And so, you know, I think the Fairfax India investment for us is interesting. Clearly, they have an expertise in India that uh, we probably will never have, but certainly do not have today. And so that was a way for us to get some exposure to India in a way that made sense. And, you know, fortunately, you know, knock on wood, it's, it's worked out very well for us so far. So, you know, um, I'm sidestepping the efficiency thing a little bit um, uh, because, you know, your, your skill set has to come first. And so, you know, I, I don't in any way want to be misleading that, you know, oh, we can look anywhere around the globe and perfectly calibrate an investment in India with an investment in Brazil with an investment in Canada. We can't. You know, each year we push further and further out on that spectrum and it's a, it's an evolution and you know would like to think that we're getting better as time goes by and um, you know I will just say it's part of what I find incredibly stimulating about the investment business that you can can look around the world and find things in different countries around the world so you know I I have to sidestep the efficiency you know something tells me you're right. I, I know you're right. Um, but when market inefficiency meets ability and executional set, I'm not sure that we've done as as fulsome a job taking advantage of those inefficiencies as, as we might, might hope to. Thank you. Uh, I had one more question. Like individual investors, they tend to panic a lot when they will see the performance that any fund at any point, for whatever reason, is underperforming the market. So are the funds structured in such a way that there are restrictions on redemption? Um, we have not. Um, we're open for money in or money out uh, once a month, um, every month. Um, we have not uh, attempted to do things in that way. But that's not to suggest that we haven't thought very deeply about that. Um, I would put the turnover rate of our investors, and I know George has met many of them, like we just don't, uh, we lose some investors, certainly everybody does over time. But, you know, we have had been able to generate um, a high degree of stickiness with our clients. And I think that comes less from putting formal restrictions and more from um, the transparency with which we talk to our clients about our mission, um, the articulation of what we do well and what we do not do well on the front end, and then I hope just attracting 
the kind of clients that buy into what you're doing. And, you know, that's come at a price, certainly. We are... Uh, we are not Vanguard. We are not the, you know, we are not uh, um, by any stretch of the imagination the largest investment management firm or anywhere close to that. And, but, you know, that's, that's by choice because we think so much of what goes on in the investment business today is this ferocious uh, turnover that is not conducive, either turnover of managers frequently trading or investors also turning over either their own portfolio or the, the, the people that they've entrusted their capital to. So we've thought a lot about that. And, you know, I'll just give you one example. And, and I, I may not have the figures exactly right, but I know I'm right with respect to the order of magnitude. Peter Lynch, a very famous investor, ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund for 13 years. Over that 13-year period, he had a 29% compounded annual rate of return. It was also a very good period for the market, and the market did 18. But, I mean, you know, 10 plus is, is stunning, stunning investment performance. Fidelity did a study, and they actually found out that the average investor in Fidelity Magellan Fund made... 6% per annum. And of course, the reason for that is that, you know, they came in after a period of um, good performance, and then they redeemed after periods of poor performance. And, you know, behaviorally, you have to do it the opposite. So, so much of what we've tried to do with our clients um, to, I suppose, varying degrees of success is, is, propagate these types of behavioral um, ways of thinking. And, you know, I would like to think that's a way more effective way of getting the capital and keeping the capital than imposing restrictions. So I, I don't know if that answers the question. but No, that, that yeah. does. I mean, I was only asking this because individual investors are irrational, as yeah. you just pointed out with your instance. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for coming. So I noticed that in the investment composition that uh, cash and other net assets is sitting at a negative. What does that really mean? And how does this affect your investment strategy? Um, that, quite frankly, first of all, that doesn't happen um, with a large degree of frequency. But quite frankly, it's happening right now because we have been very active in event-driven investments, which will roll over in the normal course of, 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 of events. And in fact, um, we will have one where we'll get our money on Friday. We have another one where we will get our money next week. And, you know, so it's highly likely by the end of April that we would be back to a net cash position. So, you know, I, I don't want to give you the impression what we don't do is we're not um, some high octane leveraged uh, hedge fund as a matter of course, but uh, from time to time, if we have opportunities, we will uh, go to a negative cash position or or make borrowings to to make investments, but always only offsetting the event driven portion of our portfolio because of its. Um, duration, high degree of reliability, and it's short duration, I feel comfortable at least um, having some leverage. And then the other part that can go into that is, you know, if you're fully invested, and let's just compare us to, to your standard mutual fund, you know, if we're fully invested and a mutual fund's fully invested and you get some redemptions, you know, what the mutual fund has to do is sell securities right away to come up with the cash to meet those redemptions, triggering a tax bill, presumably for the remaining investors in the fund, you know, we might take the approach that, look, at, we know we've got some new capital coming into the fund three months from today. I'm, I'm just making that up that will offset this leverage that we're taking 
taking today to make the the redemption in question, but we preserved our, you know, we haven't been in a position where we had to sell something um, that we still liked, and more importantly, triggering a tax bill for our remaining investors. So there's a whole host of sort of tactical issues that go into that, but the most important would be when we borrow, it is most often to offset uh, a portion, a portion, not the whole event-driven portfolio, but a portion of the event-driven portfolio. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Thank you for coming down to speak with us today. Um, your firm has obviously been fairly successful over the past <clears throat> past 23 years of, uh, of its life. Uh, you did mention that you've hit some stumbling blocks. You've hit, uh, stubbed a few toes along the way. And one of your comments that stood out to me was that there were a couple of operator failures uh, along the way. Um, moving forwards as, as uh, potential future investment managers, how do we, what, what were those failures? Were they preventable? And how, what can we learn from, from those moving forwards? I'm glad that's the last question and not the first question. I didn't want to put you on the spot. But uh, no, um, no, happy, happy to, to talk to it. Um, so, uh, and I will name some names, but I'll, I'll try and group, you know, the types of mistakes that, that we have perhaps made over the years. Um, the first one that leaps to mind is with our long-term investment holdings where, you know, the, wow, just didn't see that coming moment. So, um, you know, the framework I like to think about is, you know, all the financials and analyzing the past performance, that's like looking out the rear view mirror of the car. And then you, you know, you swivel and you look out the front windshield and that's all about saying, okay, do we think the future, is there anything we can point to that would lead us to the conclusion that the future is going to be radically different from the past? And if in all good conscience we can answer that question yet, that, you know, it will unfold the way it has been, you know, then we'll make an investment. And, you know, sometimes you just don't see the competitive um you know, disruptor uh, coming along that that changes things. And, you know, Buffett's talked a lot about newspapers over the years and how, you know, it was just such a wonderful business with fabulous economics. And then, you know, along came the internet and, you know, disrupted the newspaper business in, 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 uh, rapid, relatively rapid fashion. And so, you know, that's one group of mistakes. Wow, never saw that one coming. I mean, the other, I think the other mistake, and, you know, it pains me to talk about this because you try to be very cognizant of, you know, whatever behavioral things are going on, but perhaps from time to time we've stepped down the quality spectrum and not, not realizing we're stepping down the quality spectrum. Third type of mistake, and hasn't happened often, but we've had a couple where we misjudged the quality of management and they really, really let us down. And uh, so that tends to be a mistake. So I'll, I'll name I'll name just one, you know. And if you want to go to the pub with me, we can stay till closing, and I can run you through the full litany of all the mistakes we've made. But you know, just to name one, you know, we and I was asked a question because I talked about this earlier with some other students. Um, we had a position in BlackBerry. Uh, at Research in Motion initially, now BlackBerry. And, you know, we, we didn't own it when it was trading at $150. So we didn't own it all the way up. Um, but we started to buy shares on the way down. I'm going to say... 2009, 2010, and you know, the operator error was specifically pointed to 2011, so you know where I'm going on this, at least in part. Um, and when we bought the shares, the company, you know, had $8 a share in cash, no debt, 
you'll recall, it owned all its buildings. Um, it had a 50% market share in the United States in, sm in, in smartphones at that point in time, growing like crazy, double digit, you know, immensely profitable, high returns on shareholder capital. And so we, we bought some shares. And, you know, we compounded the mistake by buying more um, as it dropped and, and on the way down. But, you know, when we started looking through the rearview mirror to paint that analogy for you, we weren't overpaying. We were buying it at like 11 times earnings, X the cash. But what did we get wrong? When you swivel around and look out the front windshield of the car, of course, we didn't see the massive disruption of Apple and other players coming into the market. And, you know, the, the, the rest, as they say, is, is history. But, you know, it's unparalleled that a company goes from a 50% market share to three, now effectively zero, but from 50 to three in, I think, a four-year period. And, you know, we just, we got that wrong. And uh, so that was very painful, and that was at least one part to blame for our year of operator error in 2011. So, um, and yeah, if you want to take it up online, the list is long. Unfortunately, I wish it was shorter than it was, but it's very long. So, great. Thank you for your vulnerability, yeah. and I look forward to the beer. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. My, my last question, I guess, the one that I always ask. Uh, what is the most important thing you learned in life and investing over the last 25 years? Um, I would say, and I, I've got to really lump a couple, uh, a couple of things into this, but one thing for me is I think it's really important to judge yourself by your own internal scorecard. Now, you need to be truthful with yourself but don't let others dictate or determine what you view as being successful or not successful and have an inner scorecard. Just make sure you're a tough grader on that internal scorecard, um, you know, at the risk of the sort of the eternal verities as, uh, as Charlie Munger says, if it's trite, it's right. I really believe, you know, honesty, integrity, um, you know, if you are if you're have to engage in huge machinations about which side of the line are we on, you're too close to the line, forget it. You know, don't, don't undertake that activity. So, you know, ethics, honesty, integrity, judging yourself by uh, your own internal scorecard, but one that's tough, tough but fair. Um, I think that'll carry you a long way in life. And, uh, you know, value your friends and family. And nobody ever went to their grave saying, you know, gee, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. And, uh, you know, that doesn't mean you can't like what you do. But, you know, trying to have some balance in your life is important. So thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>